Yeah, well, I wouldn't say they almost lost. I, I think it was pretty much assured uh, after the 27, 24-7 lead at halftime. Obviously, they didn't play well in the second half, and the Jets got it to within one score. But you never got the feeling that it was out of hand, uh, even after the Matthews fumble. Uh, it's just, you know, the Jets can't play that way. That's not what they're built for, to come from behind. And, and it's not what Brian Fitzpatrick does. So, uh, you know, and, and then you add on top of it, Chris Ivory not playing, Eric Decker not playing. So they were really behind the eight ball. Darren Sproul set the tone with the punt return, and it kind of took off from there. It, it was an ugly win, yes, but at, at this stage, any win is obviously a positive for the Eagles. John, you wrote that a few simple tweaks by Chip Kelly made all the difference in the world in the running game. What are some of the tweaks that they did uh, that helped this game, running game get off the ground? Well, you know, the first thing is the second offensive play of the game. Sam Bradford was under center. Ryan Matthews goes off left tackles for 27 yards, I believe. And that basically nearly tripled what DeMarco Murray had done in the first two weeks with the, the inside-outside zone running. Uh, that was a constant uh, through that first 120 minutes of football. So uh, I, I think it was a very, very big positive that Chip kind of acknowledged this isn't working. we got to try something else. And he let the quarterback go under center more than he had. Uh, and I think it was uh, very, very helpful against a tremendously talented Jets front. Uh, there was a lot of issues uh, in other areas of this game. They did run the ball better. But Sam Bradford, 14-28, to 28. I, I can't think of a word to describe what he is doing or what I'm seeing from him, John. Uh, but there were plays for him to make. He didn't make them. Now, he, there were some drops again. But I, I, at some point, we got to stop saying, well, his, his weapons aren't helping him. He had guys open, and he's missing them. Yeah, it's specifically the outside guys. I mean, two – plays you can really look at were the the wheel routes which for some reason the Jets didn't cover all day uh the one was for a touchdown to Ryan Matthews there were two more that could have went for a touchdown and they were both drops one by Sproles and 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 one by Matthews so if those two you know come to fruition uh the numbers look a lot a lot better the Eagles win a lot uh easier uh, and people aren't, you know, putting Sam under the microscope today. But you're right. As far as getting the ball to the outside receivers, he's not getting it done. And, and the two times Nelson Aguilar was open, uh, he missed them both times. Uh, and it's a concern. Part of it is the fact that it's time to sound the alarm with this receiver group. It's not good. Uh, and Sam doesn't have confidence in him, and I think it – it comes to the forefront from both ends. I was going to ask you that, John. I mean, at what point you've been around quarterbacks all over the NFL, you've been doing this a long time. When a quarterback doesn't believe that the guy's going to catch the ball, he starts to lose confidence. It seems that Bradford doesn't have faith that any of these guys are going to help him out. No, and and that part I can't blame him for because other than Jordan Matthews, there there is literally not one receiver uh, that has stepped up on this team this year. Now you can mention there was another play to Miles Austin where where Miles got the uh, got the inside route and he was open and, and Sam missed him badly. Uh, so it, it's it's a concern on, on both ends. But if I'm this team, I start looking heavily at going to more. Uh, whether it's 22 personnel with two tight ends and two running backs or whether it's even three tight ends and getting Trey Burton involved uh, because Nelson Aguilar, Josh Huff, who obviously didn't play yesterday but hasn't been playing well before that, Riley Cooper got banged up. These guys are just not contributing. Yeah, and obviously uh, I I thought last night was interesting if you watched the Sunday night game. It it was basically the same situation. The Broncos have not been running the ball well and they kind of uh, tweaked a little bit by going from the shotgun to the pistol so that they can get that running back lined up right behind Manning to kind of at least, you know, not uh, telegraph where they're going there. Is that something that maybe Chip Kelly we could see evolve to down the road? Well, he should. He's got to mix it up more. And and as I said, I thought that was one of the – maybe the most positive development was the fact that both coaches, Chip Kelly and Bill Davis on defense also – kind of morphed and I didn't think they would do that uh they haven't shown 
any inkling that they would move away from the base philosophies. And to their credit, they, they tweak things a little bit. It wasn't huge moves or anything like that, but it's, it's positive. And the fact that they're willing to acknowledge, hey, this might be an issue and try something else, uh, it's very, very important for this team's success moving forward. John, they won a lot of games last year because of defensive turnovers and special teams touchdowns. That's something that the Jets did uh, coming into the game, NFL high 10 takeaways, but four turnovers and a punt return. We really, for the first time this year, saw one of the ingredients that made the Eagles a winning team last year. Yeah, and Todd Bowles mentioned it. He, he said the Eagles beat uh, beat the Jets at their own game because, as you mentioned, they had an NFL high 10 turnovers. They were plus eight coming in, uh, and they turn it over four times. They only take it away once. Uh, so that's really what won the football game for the Eagles, along with the punt return, which is that special teams touchdown. Uh, it's very similar to last year because when you step back and you think about the offense as a whole, there was no passing game really you know only generated 17 points because seven of them came on the sprolls touchdown uh the punt return so there's plenty of issues on the offensive side of the ball but uh the the opportunistic defense was back and and the special teams acumen was back john mcmullen's with us here looking at yesterday's game 97.3 espn.com he's got a ton on this game and one of the things too you know defensively uh you wrote a piece about jordan hicks my, you know, we, we, you're looking at the offensive side of the ball, and we'll dive back into them in a minute. But w- is Hicks a guy that has to be out in the field? I mean, has he uh, been able to show that the coaches need to have this guy out in the field? Or, I mean, when Kendricks comes back, does Hicks go out? I mean, you were talking about Kendricks, Ryans, and Alonzo. How are you going to get those three guys on the field? It almost seems like Hicks is a guy that has to be out there now, too. Yeah, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, I think in, in it's going to work out anyway because, as, you know, I've been pretty honest. I don't think Kiko is going to be back this season. Uh, so, uh, you know, that in theory hurt the linebacker rotation inside. But all of a sudden Jordan Hitch comes out of nowhere and you still have the ability to use three inside linebackers. And, you know, you almost have to ride the hot hand. He is doing some amazing things for a rookie. Uh, has an interception, a forced fumble, uh, team high 10 tackles. He's just putting up some numbers that you can't ignore. There's the occasional rookie mistake alignment things, but that's what D'Amico Hines is very good at. He he tends to correct those things pre-snap, so that's helpful. Uh, and, and Jordan Hicks is one of the really, really big positives of this team early in the season. Another thing uh, with, with some newcomers, I thought Brandon Bear might be under the, the microscope, but I thought – Two of the three pass defenses, uh, balls that he bats down, I thought really came at some key times. He played a pretty good game yesterday. Did he play other than those things that you actually noticed, you know, uh, tipping balls and doing those type of things, which get you in the stat sheet? Um, I was concerned with Thornton being out that that would be a problem, but I thought he really played well. No, he did. He he was another guy, along with Hicks, that you didn't expect. And Eric Rowe also add to that category. Uh, and really, if you think about the first two weeks, uh, and Cedric Thornton is a solid player, hadn't played all that well. Taylor Hart had given you nothing. And, and when you're play, playing the five technique like Bear is and, and you, you flash in a football game and people notice you, that's saying something because that uh, uh, is designed, that position is designed pretty much to tie up blockers. So the fact that he was so impactful uh, has to do with his length and I think at least – the Eagles have to consider moving him ahead of Taylor Hart again, even when Hart gets healthy. Uh, John's with us here, John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. And, of course, uh, you know, uh, another uh, interesting part of that game yesterday, you mentioned Rowe, and you've been saying this for the last couple of weeks, just get him out there, see what he's got, let him learn on the job. Uh, Did Rowe earn himself more playing time? And you wonder, did he only get the shot because Maragos got hurt? Yeah, there's no question. That's the only reason he was out there. The Eagles played a lot of nickel, a lot of time for the first time uh, in the season last year. So when Maragos got down, it was actually E.J. Biggers who came in in the slot, and Rowe was only in for the dime. So Biggers got uh, a lot more of the reps. Rowe was out there for about 15, 16 snaps, and, and he did a tremendous job with him getting his first interception, obviously the big pass defense down the down the left sideline. So 
uh, it, it, you know, when you have talented guys, sometimes they're not the greatest in the world when it comes to practice and the mundane stuff. But you got to get them out on the field, and you got to see what they're able to do. Uh, and I think you saw the ability of not only Roe, but also Pierce, for that matter. Eagles got to get these guys on the field. Yeah, that enables uh, Malcolm Jenkins to stay back at his natural position, which helps. Uh, and they're just a better football team because then Maragos can concentrate on special teams, which is his wheelhouse. Yeah, and uh, I thought Thurman, you know, he's played pretty good. I mean, he's kind of been under the radar too because he's not a big hitter or anything. Uh, but he is. Uh... He's been a pleasant surprise at that safety spot, a spot he's never really played before. Yeah, he's given the Eagles exactly what they wanted. So he's a guy they're certainly not disappointed in. They wanted a safety with ball skills and, and coverage ability, and that's what they got. And it makes sense because he obviously is a corner uh, throughout his college and NFL career. So he can obviously cover better than your average safety. He's obviously got better ball skills. The one thing you question, as you mentioned, is the running game. Yeah, occasionally he shows up and misses a tackle, but it hasn't been as egregious to where you look at it and say, this isn't working. So that's one of the moves the Eagles made that has turned in, in a very good direction. All right, I want to get your opinion on the running back situation. I know Chip Kelly today basically said, we don't know, that's not something that we look at, I have no idea. Uh, who is the better fit? Is it, you know, we watched Matthews succeed yesterday, so is it easy to say, well, then he's obviously better uh, or do you think Murray would have had a you know if, if, moving forward here? What should the running back distribution uh, you know distribution look like? I think when Demarco is healthy, it'll be what it was as planned, and he'll be the the, the number one. And and Matthews will will spell him, and Darren Sproles will obviously be uh, the situational back to to be third or split out because as we mentioned. That's another thing you can use to get some of those receivers off the field, whether it's Darren Sproles in the slot or, you know, Ertz and, and Shelley playing at the same time. But I, I think DeMarco Murray would have had success yesterday, uh, you know, running the football when Bradford was under center, similar to what Ryan Matthews did. Uh, so I, I think, you know, it was more of the Eagles realized they had to help everybody, and, and, and that's where the positive direction came from. I, I, you know, to lay it all on the feet of DeMarco Murray, uh, just because they had a pretty decent game, I, I think that's kind of short-sighted at this point. Do you think Kelly, he was very brief in describing why Murray didn't play. Doesn't seem like he's offered a whole heck of a, he doesn't like to talk about the injuries, that's evident, but uh, basically said he tried, the player tried, he couldn't go. Is that him saying we wanted him to play, but he decided, it was his decision not to? Generally, when you hear the player, that's the old Bill Parcells trick. <laughs> uh, it generally indicates the coach isn't happy. But we always talk about leg injuries with, with skill position players. You saw the same thing with Josh Huff. Like, it's very difficult to play, whether it's running back, wide receiver, uh, cornerback on defense, safety, if your legs aren't there. So it's not a surprise when the player uh, feels that he, he can't go uh, if he's not 100%. And you add on top of that, Murray wasn't effective in the first two weeks, so the last thing he wants on his mind is a, is a third straight terrible week. So I kind of understand his mental makeup uh, coming into that game, but obviously a coach wants to see a player that says, yeah, I'll go, I'll, I'll take the football. So you see both sides of the coin, but each each side is also understandable. You were there yesterday, John. Um get a sense that there was like an exhale in that locker room after the you know being there to, against Dallas and, and seeing uh, I'm sure walking around seeing the team 0 and 2 was it a much different atmosphere afterwards oh no question I, I mean I you did the research before the game if you start 0 and 2 in this league since the division realignment in 20 uh, 2002 uh, you, you make the playoffs 9.4% of the time. So that's bad enough. But it kind of shaken off by the fact that this is going to be a poor division. We all understand that now. If you're 0-3, though, since 2002, teams are 0 for 8 making the playoffs. So it, it's a virtual death sentence. Only six teams have done it all time. Uh, and the Eagles would have been, even in this bad division, been in the deep hole that they're probably not going to get out of. Yeah, um, let me ask you, you know, is this defense to you 
Can they hang their hat with this defense and let the offense catch up? Are they good enough on defense that they can, you know, have these growing pains on offense? Well, they have been two of the three weeks. That's the bottom line. So for all the criticism Bill Davis gets, uh, they've been good enough to win in two of the three weeks, and, and the offense hasn't really been good enough for all three. Uh, so they are carrying this football team right now, and when they are opportunistic like they were yesterday, uh, it becomes a lot easier. It's tough to get four turnovers each and every week. We understand that. Uh, but I was impressed with Bill Davis, too, playing a lot of nickel, playing a lot of zone. One, because he realized, who his opponent was. And he realized with Ryan Fitzpatrick, at quarterback, it's not Aaron Rodgers. you got a 17-point lead. You can just run out that clock. That was a different mentality for the Eagles and I think a positive one. Yeah, and, and you know, late in that game, that was the one thing, too, that, that, that kind of was discouraging to see that they had problems running the game out again. Yeah, and and they're not used to it. It's it's that's one of the things. I mean, they generally don't play clock. They generally don't worry about time of possession. Uh, so all of a sudden, when you're struggling so badly, and you look at the fact that you have a 17 point lead against a team that's not explosive offensively, and all of a sudden you try to do something that you don't practice, you don't prepare for, uh, you're going to have some hiccups. But I, I think by and large, it went pretty well. If, if Matthews doesn't fumble that football in the fourth quarter, uh, you don't even notice it. If if either he or Darren Sproles catches uh, the other wheel routes, you probably don't notice it. Uh, so if they just clean up some little mistakes, uh, things uh, will get a lot better. All right, John McMullen, tomorrow live at the uh, Golden Nugget for four hours. We'll break down this game a lot more. We'll also look at the division. The Eagles have a division game. Uh, the schedule works out nicely for them coming up. I mean, they got three really winnable games before that Carolina game. Then they got the bye going into Dallas. So, hey, they have a chance to turn their thing around. And if they can continue to make the adjustments, uh, you know, teams people might start feeling a little bit better. But I'll tell you, John, until the quarterback starts to play more consistently, I, I, I don't, I, you know, I think the feeling is going to still be that this team's just average at best. No, I agree with you. They are average at best now. And and part of it, as I said, certainly hinges on the quarterback who doesn't look comfortable. Uh, but don't undersell the fact that these receivers aren't getting it done. So uh, I think the time is, is now to shift toward more of a two-tight end or, or, or a two-back or get Sproles out there a little bit more uh, and try to mask – uh, the fact that you don't have big time receivers on the outside. By the way, John, I, I, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. Now, you, we do the Golden Gridiron every Tuesday. I, we put our picks in. You know, uh, I'm running a 13 and one week right now. Wow! Wow! <laughs> now, and, you know, I it, it took me. You know, it was so crowded because everybody's coming to to check out our show, and I thank them for that. <laughs> it took me about an hour after the show last week to get my picks in, and I did not go 13 and one. <laughs> Well, the picks that I made on Tuesday uh, were not my best picks. It was the picks I made on Saturday night at 2.17 a.m. Uh, that uh, came into fruition. And uh, I looked at it tonight. I said, man, I don't remember making any of these picks, but I'm almost perfect. <laughs> the the well, game that got... Go. I, I... You know, I subscribe to the Mike and Mike series, the sheet of integrity. It's only one sheet per week for me, and that's it. I'll live and die on my pick. Uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, the game that bit me, too, was that Rams-Pittsburgh game. That Nick Foles got me yesterday. He looked terrible in that game. Uh, that game was awful. Yeah, and, and, you know, obviously Ben went down for the Steelers. So that that is looking like Cincinnati is, is playing solitaire now. They're all by themselves, and it looked like it was going to be a really, really tough division. Well, we'll have more on the NFL uh, week number three uh, tomorrow once uh, the Monday night game tonight is done. If uh, Green Bay wins, uh, I could be $5,000 richer tomorrow there, uh, and, and the dinner will be on me, John. I appreciate it. You know, I'll be looking. <laughs>